Okay, this hand is similar to the other ones, um, except it's at a higher stake, and it's against a much better player. Um, so, folds around to the button, who's um, a very solid and competent high stakes regular. Um, we're in the big blind with ace, ace, queen, eight, single suited. Um, and the decision is, do we call or do we three bet? Um, something that I want to talk about, and I harped on it a little bit earlier, is that, uh, you know, you can three bet... Uh, with a wider range against almost any player, no matter what their skill level is, when you're in position. Um, but when you're out of position, uh, how profitably you can 3-bet becomes much more opponent-dependent. Um, you know, almost regardless of your hand strength against good opponents, it's typically a bad idea to, to start adjusting by 3-betting more out of position. That's typically not how you're going to make your money. Um, now, when... Uh, or in this in this case, the things that I would look for are number one is open sizing, um, and also you know with this open sizing in mind, uh, what kind of SPR we're going to create for ourselves post flop. And I think that you can see here, especially since he only opened two and a half x um, when we three bet, which is what we decide to do, we create um, a situation where we're going to have going to be forced to play um, at least two streets out of position against a good player, um, and. Although ace ace queen eight single suited is like um, you know these can be considered like pretty strong aces overall, um, you know they're only gonna flop strong on like you know 15 to 20 percent of flops. So on the other 80 uh, percent of flops you that you play when you flop something medium or um, you don't flop really anything at all, um, you're gonna be in a tough spot um, and you're gonna end up losing money in one way or another. So. I think that against uh, weaker players who are more straightforward post-flop or who are going to incorrectly get it in bad post-flop, I think that the three-bet would be pretty good. Um, but against more skilled players, I think it's better to keep the pot small, look for some check-raising opportunities, um, and also remember, like, actually play with a pretty disguised range. Um, when the flop comes ace-high, you get, a, uh, you know, y your hand is disguised in that way, um, and you can, get, you, you can get money this, you know, from his barrels. Um, and also when the board comes short and paired, you know, you you get extra value also from like over pairs and stuff like that. Um, Yurk, am I missing anything or what, what, what's your thought process like against, you know, when you, perhaps you're playing at higher stakes, maybe you're, you were shot taking at this time, I'm not really sure. Um, and you're playing like these more skilled opponents as you move up. Yeah, definitely. Like everything you said makes perfect sense. And also, yeah, at that time I was uh, was one of my first shots on 1020. So I wasn't comfortable at all, had no ideas about the dynamics and like how the players uh, react and play um, pre and post flop. But yeah, we can, like, the only reasons I could see for us three betting this hand would be if we're up against somebody who is uh, four betting very light. But we can't know that. We can't assure that. We we shouldn't assume that since we are we are also like unknown at the table. And but we yeah we buy in 400 big blinds uh, played probably over the first couple of hands uh, tag style. So they have a pretty good idea that we are some regulars that are a regular that is trying to take a shot at the higher stake. But yeah, there's like no. Uh, reason to get into like uh, pre-flop warfare with three or four bettings. So the most likely outcome is that he opens when we three bet. He's just going to call and play in position uh, against a well-defined range, basically, um, since he can ex put us pretty uh, well on high cards for the most part. So we, yeah, we actually play into his cards, uh, into his plan by three betting this type of hand here. Yeah, definitely. And I, I, I alluded to that a little bit earlier in the video that like when you open the button and it folds to the big blind and someone three bets you, typically it's a pretty strong hand. Like I would consider that their ranges in that kind of situation are a lot stronger. And I found that like especially with regulars, I mean their ranges um, for three betting out of the small blind are typically weaker than three betting out of the big when it's that kind of situation. Just because um, you know that they, they're keen to. Um, knowing that it's better to 3-bet from the small than to peel in most situations so you're not stuck out of position and you take the initiative uh, with the hand. Basically the same thing that we're prescribing to you guys. Um, so yeah, like there's nothing worse than 3-betting uh, a good player and basically like telegraphing your hand to them and giving them plenty of room to maneuver post-flop. It's just like not how you're going to make money. Exactly. So, um, so what, yeah, yeah, what happens to this? Yeah, he, he calls of course. And uh, flop comes king nine eight two tone. 
Um, so you're like, as played, like, what do you think the best plan of attack is here? Like, should you be bet folding or check folding or like check jamming, just like getting it in? Like, what do you think? Uh, even though it may sound uh, weakish in the first uh, instant, but I actually think nowadays that the best option is to just check fold here, because this board just hits about everybody's ranges. Um, so when we bet here, he's very likely having a hand that is able to continue, at least by calling or even by raising. So we don't have a lot of fold equity on the seabed here. And uh, on the other side, when we do check, uh, we can expect him since he's like he's a good aggressive high stakes player, but he also knows that I may go for a check raise on this board quite a, a decent amount of time. So he is not that prone to actually bet with mediocre draw. Like if he has a bear jack ten type of hand, I doubt that he's betting with it. Uh, he would rather take the free card. And now on the turn, we have a much better idea. Like we know that he doesn't have a strong made hand. He probably doesn't have a strong draw. Right. So now we can start betting on blank turn cards. But on the flop, we, yeah, we should just not start building a pot uh, that we are probably forced to give up on later streets. So yeah, just check for it. Since this betting range is too strong, either strong draw or strong made hand that we are already ahead or we will be uh, sorry behind or we will uh, lose on later streets when some of the draws complete yeah you make a lot of really good points i really like what you said about uh you know if it checks through delayed c betting a lot of different turns and that's actually a pretty strong move and something that i've gotten more comfortable implementing in my own game because i think that like uh when i first started playing or i guess just in the past um, I didn't really know how to play when I wasn't taking the aggressive line. So if I checked this flop, I didn't know how to play if it checked through. And I thought that opponents would never give me cr give me credit. But I think it's important to note that like when the flop checks through, you can still have like whiffed check raises in your range, which is actually pretty cool. Um, so you can lead like you know turn pairs. You can lead like if the turn is like a club. Even um, I think that like you know you can lead and give yourself a pretty good price to just take it down. Um, what do you think about that? Definitely, hundred percent agree. Um, so, uh, as played, we actually do decide to bet, and he calls. Um, and yeah, as as Eric said, I mean, it's just it's a really tough spot because he can he he just has like all of his options available to him. He can float very profitably. Um, if he has like a two pair type hand, he can gain more visibility of his hand value by just peeling. Um, if he has like a naked club draw, he can call. Like, there's just so many different ways for him to make money in position with this SPR. Yeah, and very few turn cards that uh, will help us to continue betting. Yeah. Yep. Um, turns of five, um, bringing another flush draw. Um, it goes check, check. Rare Rivers, the deuce of clubs. We check, and he bets 500. And we call. Can you expect, before we look at his cards, I want you to explain your call thinking at the time. Like, maybe you think that you. Um, incorrectly called now, looking back on it, but what was your thinking at the time, and maybe what would you have done differently? Uh, sure, so at first glance, we obviously know that he is pretty polarized for betting this river, so to a flush or nothing, mm -hmm. since he doesn't have a 7-6 straight, uh, he doesn't have a strong made hand, like a set or two pairs. Um, so the question is whether believe him having a flush or not, and in the first instance, you may think, uh, a lot of his flush draw combinations may have uh, raised on the flop directly because they will have, uh, have something to go with it and he's more likely to have some missed straight draws some uh, jack 10 or queen jack 10 type of hands right. that now uh, that have no showdown value and now try to bluff so that uh, was what I was thinking at that moment and that led me into the call but Nowadays, I think I would fold uh, since he knows the same that what we just elaborated and uh, he can expect to get uh, ca called quite light here. Um, so he's not like prone to, to bluff here, but rather value betting with any flush. Right. Um, cool. I think that's a really good point. We see his hand here in a second. That he has queen knight flush, um, and we lose. But what do you, I mean, what do you think about his line overall? Like, um, I think that a lot of players may, may be surprised that he didn't jam the flop. Um, what do you think about his 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 flop call instead of raising? 
Uh, I think it's the best. Like he played the hand perfect. Uh, he there's no need for him to to raise the flop. Maybe obviously we would have probably folded here bare aces or a bare king, but. Uh, he will get us to fold on a later point if he wants uh, to. Um, and he just keeps all his option available by just calling. He can rep uh, straights uh, with his 10 blockers. So on a 7 or a 6, he can just bet on the turn when we check to him. Or he can raise over a turn bet. He, his, fl his second flush draw obviously is pretty strong, like a pretty strong value hand. Uh, he has a gut shot. The set outs are probably good. So his hand just has so much playability on later street and it would be just a waste of value to race on the flop. And there's still obviously the decent chance that when he's up against aces with a flush draw, he's pretty crushed. Against a set, he's not doing that great, like a set of kings. So he, yeah, he's not pushing an equity edge on the flop and he maintains his playability. So well played, Villain. <laughs> Yeah, NH as the kids are saying nowadays. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, cool. All right, uh, let's wrap up for today. Um, thanks again for listening in, and be sure to check out the third installment of Alien Slayer and I's three betting series here at PLOQuickPro.com. Thanks, guys. Hey, what's going on, guys? Casino Crime here. Now, if you like this video and you want more, then go ahead and click the subscribe button below right now. And if you want to join me for more of my six max success secrets and free video tutorials, just click the link to the right. See you inside the trainings. Good luck.